a major leak has revealed that you will in fact almost be able to build your own Steam Deck from parts, and a whole lot more in today's Deck News Roundup. Let's get into it. What's good, Deck Gang? Before we get into the main topic, I want to say thank you for the reception to my last video where I showcased different things the community was working on for the Steam Deck. It was one of my favorite videos to make, and I'm so happy to see my people enjoying it too. So sincerely, thank you. And on that note, if you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen me going a little crazy for some Steam Deck concepts that were showing up on my feed. These are by Popart, who is notable for making really sick custom art controllers that have like this texture to them. The marketing on these controllers say a design you can really feel. And yeah, the controllers are dope, but these Steam Deck concepts are even better. You tell me which of these is your favorite, but we have Spider-Man, Gears, Halo, and my personal favorite, Cyberpunk. I've never actually sat down and played Cyberpunk for more than a few minutes, but I need this design. The way the yellow pops with the neon blue borders and the texture grips, I mean, what do I need to do to get one of these? No, really, I tried to proposition Pope to get some advanced scoop on whether or not these babies will come to life, but he shut me down immediately. I, I don't blame him, but he did say that he does have a quote, very big Steam Deck surprise that will blow many minds. Keep watching, end quote. Trust me, Pope, I will. Also, if you look at his pinned tweet, he had another tease that might be related. He said, quote, This really is the biggest thing that is going to happen to Pope Art like crazy big. I am just in total shock. I cannot wait for you all to find out. End quote. So some big things are happening over at Popart and I can't wait to see what the Steam Deck surprise is. Speaking of big things, I am just moments away from 15k y'all. If you are enjoying this video then hit the like button and if you've been watching my videos and are still unsubscribed, then now's the time my friends. Show me what you're made of and hit that subscribe button, maybe even set notifications to all so you can see me talk about improved GameCube emulation performance on the Steam Deck. Yeah, that's coming soon. All right, it's time to talk about that iFixit leak. That's right, folks, back on Friday, Steam Deck parts showed up on the iFixit store. People noticed it and the news quickly spread, but it turns out these were test pages that were accidentally leaked and not meant for public access. That said, what was available for sale was much more comprehensive than most people expected. They had virtually every part available. We expected the analog stick assemblies, the SSD, and the battery, and those were all there. Technically, the SSD and the battery were placeholder and out of stock, but I don't really doubt that those will become available because take a look at all the other things that were for sale. There was the front plate, the back plate, assemblies for bumpers and triggers, the main board, left and right daughter boards, speakers, either of the two possible screens, the fan, and the membranes needed for the buttons and the D-pad. They even had special kits like the screen fix kit that comes with what they call the eye opener. Apparently this thing can be microwaved so that it's hot enough to loosen the adhesive on the screen in order to remove it. In any case, that's a lot of pieces. That's damn near everything. It's still missing touch pads, a heat sink, actual buttons, D-pads, and a mid-frame that sits between the display and the other components. It's possible that these could be things that come in the future, but it does seem unlikely since these are not probable candidates for repair. While you may want to replace your buttons with aftermarket alternatives, it's doubtful that your original buttons would break in the first place. In that way, it doesn't necessarily make sense for iFixit to stock these items that likely wouldn't sell. That said, I'd love to do a video where I build as much of a Steam Deck as I can from iFixit parts. That would be rad. For a 512GB version, that would run me over $700 before buying the remainder of the components, so obviously more expensive than an actual Steam Deck, but that's kind of to be expected. While looking at the list of parts, I noticed that while there are fix kits for the display and the fan as well as the analog sticks, there's no fix kit for the battery. It's particularly conspicuous by its absence considering both how tough of a repair it is, but also how essential of a repair it is. To that note, The Verge reported on this as well, and they got a quote from the CEO of iFixit with regard to the battery repairs on the Steam Deck. CEO Kyle Weens said, quote, we are building a solution for repairing the Steam Deck that includes all the step-by-step -step guides and parts that you need to fix your deck. Our initial release includes the parts and tools to complete most repairs. We don't have a solution for the battery repairs on day one, but we are committed to working with Valve to maintain these devices as they age. Battery replacements are going to be essential to making the Steam Deck stand the test of time." End quote. 
it's good to know that they're on it and yeah they do have some runaway here considering that the batteries shouldn't need to be replaced so soon better to take their time and get it right so those pages appeared early afternoon on friday and by the evening i fix it had corrected the error and posted the following on twitter quote earlier today we published some pages related to our upcoming parts launch with valve these went live earlier than we planned so we ended up taking them down if you did get a parts order in we'll honor it stay tuned for the real launch soon End quote. That all sounds reasonable and it's kind of amazing that they'll honor the orders that were placed. I really look forward to seeing what kind of stock they'll have and seeing the stories of the community members doing their own repairs. And I mean that's what it's all about, right? The right to repair. I've already bought the thing and I shouldn't have to rely on the maker of the thing for basic repairs. The manufacturer shouldn't have a monopoly on repairs and I shouldn't be relegated to selling my device for parts because the manufacturer decides that fixing the thing that they created is not a profit center. Let me open my device up. In fact, show me how. Let me buy what I need to do my own repairs or even to go to an independent shop that will do the repair for me. Allow a tinkering community to develop and flourish around your product. And that's precisely what Valve have done here. The Steam Deck community is only just getting started and it's already flourishing thanks to the decisions that Valve have made. And these decisions were made well before the iFixit partnership, even the way the internals are architected or repair friendly, battery notwithstanding. These are decisions that Valve made a long time ago that are paying major dividends now. I should note that the iFixit shop also had parts for the Valve Index. It wasn't as comprehensive as the Steam Deck shop, but it's good to see that these are here as well. That said, now that people will be able to purchase the Steam Deck mainboard, perhaps it's time, as sadly it's Radley tweeted, for someone to make their own Deckard. If you're not familiar, that's the code name of the standalone virtual reality headset that Valve are reported to be prototyping. In any case, let's see once again what the community cooks up. All right, moving on to some software updates. A lot of big little things happened in the past week. First, there are now audio drivers for Windows. So now you've got pretty much everything you need for Windows. There's Bluetooth, graphics, network, and now audio drivers. The only thing missing is the ability to dual boot Windows with SteamOS on the onboard storage. As I understand, there are technically ways to do this now, but it seems pretty involved. That said, I personally have very low interest in running Windows on the Steam Deck. I don't even want to play games on the desktop mode of Steam OS. I think that part of what makes Steam Deck accessible to a wider audience is the game mode. It's easy to navigate and the way that Gamescope has been integrated adds a lot of quality of life to gaming that otherwise doesn't exist on the PC. What do you think? Have you installed Windows? What are you using it for? We also have some updates on the Steam OS side. You can now reset your performance profile if you want to go back to a fresh slate, so that's nice. There are also some performance profile bug fixes. Notably, I previously had an issue where my frame limit setting would not stick to what I set, but now that's been resolved. They also added stuff to the header bar of the lock screen, the battery indicator, network indicator, and the clock. You can also now add the battery percentage to the header, which is very handy. There have also been more updates to the fan curve. Once again, the general idea here is to let the fan stay at lower RPMs or completely off for longer periods of time. As a result, the Steam Deck will run a little warmer, but hopefully within a tolerable range. However, according to user reports, the results appear to be a little mixed. Some people are complaining not just about the results in temperatures, but also people are starting to feel some of the heat on their hands. Or in the case of this user, they were resting the deck on their knees and they started to feel the deck burning on their knees. I would say this marks the first time I've seen something like this being reported where the heat on the device itself is bothersome. More importantly, some users are reporting the deck shutting down entirely, particularly when playing Middle Earth Shadow of War and even at 40 Hz. It appears that due to the heat and the software issues, the most recent changes have actually been rolled back. It looks like Valve is trying to find a sweet spot that is as quiet as possible while maintaining a safe range of temperatures. As a result, some people have begun to request more explicit control of the fan curve, and I've got to agree here, I think I'd err on the side of keeping the device cool by default, but letting me choose a more relaxed fan curve if I'm okay with a little more heat. A couple presets would be enough to satisfy most users' needs. There's actually an unofficial plugin called Fantastic that is meant to allow you to control the fan curve, but it didn't seem to appreciably change the RPMs for me, so maybe I was doing something wrong. Anyway, I expect Valve to eventually give us the opportunity to pick from two or three different presets, so we'll see how that story develops. As I mentioned at the top, the reception to my last video was really good, so I want to start doing a community spotlight as often as I can. 
This week, I have two highlights. The first is from user Only Questions on the Steam Deck subreddit. He's created a Steam community guide for the Steam Deck itself, and it's really quite good. It's comprehensive, covering basically everything. I mean, Deck Verified, Steam Input, External Controls, Performance Tinkering, Typing, Global Shortcuts, Multitasking, Remote Play, Desktop Mode, and more. It's also really easy to read with not just lots of pictures, but lots of GIFs as well, so you can pretty easily follow the whole thing. This is probably the best first tour you can get of the Steam Deck, so be sure to check it out. And major props to Only Questions for putting that together. The second community spotlight I have for you is this arcade cabinet powered by a Steam Deck. This was shared on the subreddit by user LA Flex. They built this cabinet some time ago, and seeing as it can be powered by any computer, the Steam Deck fits the bill. This person also has excellent taste, not only Bayonetta, Vanquish, Nuclear Throne, and Dead Cells, but they also show off Def Jam Fight for New York on the custom cap. That's dope, because I need to run that Dub C versus Nori right quick. Hey yo kid, love don't live here no more for you, Kiko. Get up out the now I mean. I'm feeling this one tonight. Alright, let's close this out with some gaming news. First up, Redout 2 has been delayed. The anticipated follow-up to the White Knuckles Futuristic Racer by 34 Big Things was slated to release later this month, but has been moved to June 16th for all platforms. The original is really, really good, and 34 Big Things have some underrated gems like Mars or Die and Super Inefficient Call. So I'm pretty excited about this sequel. That said, I don't mind the delay and would much rather that they get it right. In other news, Stalker 2 is back in development. The developers were based out of Kiev, Ukraine, but have since moved to Czech Republic to resume development there. Stalker is a bit of a Steam darling, and I look forward to whatever they're able to create now that they're relatively safe. Continuing on the subject of sequels, Norman Reedus has once again let the cat out of the bag with regard to Death Stranding 2. He reportedly told digital outlet Leo Edit that, quote, we just started working on the second one, end quote. I wonder what this does for the people that think Kojima might be working on some sort of Silent Hill successor. I, for one, would like Kojima to do whatever the hell he wants to do. And by now you've heard about Embracer buying up Western Studios and properties from Square. Well, an interesting new tidbit has come out of an earnings report. First reported by Nibel Lion, it appears that they're interested in more than just sequels. Here's what Embracer had to say, quote, After the end of the quarter, we further strengthened our development capabilities and IP portfolio by entering into an agreement to acquire Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal, and Square Enix Montreal, including Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, Thief, and Legacy of Kane, and other IPs. The announcement got an overwhelming and positive response. We see a great potential not only in sequels, but also in remakes, remasters, spin-offs, as well as transmedia projects across the group. End quote. So remakes and remasters, huh? Now that sounds interesting. What remakes or remasters would you like to see? Soul Reaver? Deus Ex? And who would you want to do them? I would like to nominate Night Dive Studios to do a Soul Reaver remake. How awesome would that be? Speaking of remasters, do you remember Shatter? It was an awesome, modernized breakout clone that was first released on PSN back when their indie library was still playing second fiddle to the Xbox Live Arcade. Soon after, it came to Steam. Anyway, a remaster of this is coming and it looks awesome. The developers say that Shadow Remaster Deluxe will feature quote, improved visual effects running at native 4K 120fps, fine-tuned innovative gameplay mechanics, and a completely remixed soundtrack in 5.1 surround sound, end quote. I bet it'll be rocking on the deck too. And finally, the word is that some former CD Projekt Red developers have joined Techland, makers of the Dying Light games, and together they are going to create a AAA open world fantasy action RPG. This could be huge and the timing could make it so that this goes head to head against the next entry in the Witcher series. Sounds like a good time to be a gamer. All right, that's gonna do it for today. If you've enjoyed this video, then smash the like button, grab the subscribe button by the cojones and let it know that you mean business. Also, if you haven't already checked out my mod video, then give that a look. Finally, I want to thank my patrons for helping me make this channel better. Thank you. Deck gang out. Goodbye.